perfect. Then a horrible time in the strange spirits have made its way into the church. And many lives are possessed by these strange spirits. So when they find a way into leadership position, it's a great deal dealing combating with men with outward holiness. Whereas inwardly there are strange spirits. So as a leader, you face very tough time. So these are some of the things we are facing. And uh, this study is further helping us to know how to survive um, leading the body of Christ at such a time as this. So we have looked at uh, foundational principles leaders must understand. Uh, we talk about the 1%. We we'll talk about um, it is better to build things than allow people to break their legs. Um, also that uh, when a person's emotion at ways the intelligence, they won't be logical. We look at hurting people naturally, hurt people, um, emotional. As leader, we must never place our emotional health in the hands of someone else. We went through all of that and five options when faced with conflict. Um, those options as follows. Um, I will get them a retaliation. I will get out, escape, and avoidance. I will give in, surrender. I will go half, um, just compromise. I will deal with it, addressing the issue, and which we say is the best option uh, rather than quitting. And then handling criticism in a healthy way, we look at those issues. Then the last thing we look there is say concentrate on your mission. Change your mistakes, not your mission. Change your mistake, not your mission. So while you are going through criticism, accept criticism, welcome criticism, but don't allow criticism to make you change your mission. You can change your mistakes if there are very um, genuine mistakes that we are making because of our leadership and we're being criticized. We we'll change them, but be focused. So today, we are going to look at um, five stages, how Paul handled uh, issues of conflict and criticism, or if you like, dealing with conflict. Living in tough time, how Paul handled it. So we're going to be reading from the book of Philemon, single chapter, and um, I will call on someone to read for us. That's whole chapter, Philemon, from verse 1 to the end. Pastor Felix, can you read for us, please? Pastor Felix. Philemon, the whole of this that for single chapter. God bless us. I, I'm in a place that I can I'm not uh, accessible to my Bible. Okay. All right. Okay. So, so I can read. Pastor C Y. Yes, please. Um. So um, uh, the book of Philemon. Would you like me to read? Yeah. And is that okay? Yes, the whole chapter. Okay. And I read in Jesus' name in the book of Philemon. Paul, a prisoner of, Jesus, of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer, to the beloved Athia, Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God making mention of you always in my prayers, hearing of your love and faith, 
which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints, that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. Therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting, yet for love's sake, I rather appeal to you, being such a one as Paul, the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in my chains, whom once was unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to you and to me. I am sending him back. You therefore receive him, that is, my own heart, whom I wished to keep with me, that on your behalf he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel. But without your consent, I wanted to do nothing, that your good deed might not be by compulsion, as it were, but voluntary. For perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose, that you might receive him forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me. But how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If then you count me as a partner, receive him as you would me. But if he has wronged you or owes anything, put that on my account. I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. I will repay, not to mention to you, that you owe me even your own self besides. Yes, brother, let me have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. But meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be granted to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ, Jesus greets you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow laborers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So thank you. We have listened to Paul's writing to Philemon in his own writing. The Apostle Paul first conflict with a man named Philemon. He foresaw the fact that he didn't share the same perspective on Onesimus, a runaway slave belonging to Philemon. The following steps that the Apostle Paul caused on conflict management. He communicates masterfully with Philemon in his letter and gives five stages to walk through the process. Remember, we are dealing on the subject leading when times are tough. So conflict management is one very, very essential um, virtue that every leader must passionately ask the Lord to bestow how to manage conflict. Because Jesus himself said, offenses must come. For sure, they must come. How you go about it is another thing. If you don't manage it, you're going to damage it. Any conflict you don't manage well, you will damage it. You're going to damage the whole place. You're going to damage the city. You're going to damage many lives. So I just pray and ask that the Lord will help us to become very diligent, to become very passionate, and trusting that the Lord, by His Holy Spirit, will help us to go the way for. Honestly, each time I listen to the reading of this single chapter, oh my God, when I read, when I listen to the reading, I know that the man, Apostle Paul, was indeed a man of God. A man left, led by the Holy Spirit. A man 
with a broken life, broken, satisfied, humble, sinful. And these are people we're going to meet over there in heaven. So we need to buckle up, praise the Lord. So we're going on now to look at um, the five stages for applied and also how we, what we can learn from it as leaders and as disciples who are also discipling all that five stages on how to handle conflict. Now we're going to be picking those verses, um, then we'll bring them out verses four to seven. So like us, somebody else to read verse four to seven, let's pick out what we need to do there. Verse four to seven. Pastor Teresa, are you there? This is four to seven. Sorry, so I didn't get what the place to read. Philemon, Philemon, this is four to seven. All right. Sir. Sorry, I'm waiting for my content. I'm sorry. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Philemon, chapter four, sir. Oh, okay, yes, sorry. Four to seven. Verse yes, four, sorry. Seven. I'm ready. Verse four to seven, I read, sir. I thank my God. Yeah. Making mention of uh, this. Always, of oh, thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith, which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints, that the communication of the faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Verse 7 For we have great joy and consolation in thy love because. The bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Verse 8. Wherefore, though I might be. Uh, Lord, yeah, yeah. But... Thank... No, that's okay. That's yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Now, so number one, the first stage that we need in surviving in a conflict and a very tough time as a leader is complement stage. Complement. Complement stage. So if you have your one book, you can write complement stage. So we find this from verse 647, just as Paul began by affirming Philemon, we must begin by focusing on positive qualities. So what do we do? We must practice the one who one the same principle mentioned previously. Always open by focusing on the positive and what you have in common. So we find here. Can you spot out what was the positive virtue in Philemon that Paul was um, was extolling? Can you spot out that positive virtue that Paul was really um, praising him for? It was uh, verse 5, sir. It says, uh, Hearing of thy love and yes. faith, which thou hast towards the Lord Jesus and towards us, sir. Thank you. So, Paul had issue in his mind. Paul had an issue, a very serious, you know, um, issue his mind was bringing to Philemon. But he didn't come to dash the issue at his face. Paul looked at the life of Philemon and said, this is a man of love and a man of faith. 
So he began to complement his positive, you know, virtues. And uh, he had been a consolation to the body of Christ and yeah, refresh the brethren. So this is something we must take very seriously. Compliment, some of us don't know how to compliment people. Once we are offended, once somebody has trespassed, you just come and you start showing the person, you say, look, you've never done anything right. You know, this is how you, what is evident, what is the proof that you're learning and not learning for all this year and all of those things. And you see, that is not the best way. Let's, so what advice this? Every human being here on earth has strength, one aspect of his or life that is positive. No one is entirely bad. So look for that one percent and develop it, make it 101 percent. Complement that stage. Number two, eight to 13. So we can take eight to 13 now. Don't worry for us, 8 to 13. Okay. 8 to 13, I read in Jesus' name. Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee, and which is convenient, yet for love's sake, I rather be CD, being such an one as Paul the age, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bones, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. Twelve, whom I have sent again. Thou therefore receive him, that is, my own boss. 13. Whom I would have returned with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the boss of the gospel. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So number two, compromise stage. Compromise. That's what we have found. Verse 18, verse 8 to 13. Paul chose to compromise and appeal to Philemon rather than make demands. So, can anyone spot out the compromise that Paul made here from the, post, the passage uh, we just read? Can you spot out the compromise? He would uh, the compromise was that he would have kept uh, Onismos with him, but he preferred rather to send him back to the master rather than keeping him behind and using him for the work of the gospel. So he had to kind of like uh, deny his own self in order to allow peace reign and send him back to the master. Okay, thank you. Um, there is still more to it. There's something very specific that uh, I really want us to get uh, from here. So I'm just look at it very properly. There is still something very key compromise that Paul uh, presented here. Yes, anyone else? Praise the Lord. Here, from verse 11 and 12, so he explained how the brother Onesimus was before, as he was unprofitable, but now, trying to open his eyes to know that now he's not what he used to be, so he can be accepted. For the great okay. 
Okay, thank you. Now let me bring you to that point of compromise because it is something that you have addressed some areas in our life. Look at this eight. Therefore, Paul says, therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting, so you may underline very bold and command. Boldness gives you the right to command. Paul had every legitimate right to command Philemon on what to do. But he said, yet for love's sake, I rather appeal to you. That's a compromise. Very thick compromise. So we must be willing to assume some responsibility for the conflict, if possible, as we bring up the issue in conflict, recognize the differences in motivation and temperament. Me them halfway. Me them halfway. Now, there was no room for adverse. Today, we have general pastors who will come and just maybe um, an associate pastor, uh, maybe a bright pastor somewhere else, and uh, something happened. He just pick up his phone and he said, Look, before the count of 10 or 2, 3 days, I want you to send this person back to me right now. So be very careful. What, what gave you right to keep and you can just give for that. Paul had this liberty. But he decided to appeal. He compromised. When you look at the position you have reached, even as a father or home, as a mother, how do you talk to your children? Do you command them? As a husband, how do you talk to your wife? As a pastor, as a leader, those small ones you know, that under you, you just command them, you issue orders, you just unleash authority on them. Here Paul is teaching us, we must humble ourselves, come to the point of compromise. The Bible says short answer, Turn it away around. What teaches us here? Do it may be all right. It may be, you know, we might have, you know, the, the grounds or what for which we can command. Let's use another approach. Let's compromise. Let's appear as see we're made. That's what he said here. What decided to meet him halfway. This is very important. As leaders, honestly, by the grace of God, as all of these things have taught me, you know, when you place value on someone else's life, you can get more from here. When you not just complimenting the strength, you now come and let him look, let him know that you are not too far higher than he. You can still meet him somewhere. The gap between both of is not much. You are operating together. Paul teaches us that. So they rather appeal to Philemon. He said, Be such a one as for the aged, and now also a prisoner of Christ. So by age, by position as a, as a, a disciple, he has all the right. But he made compromise. Number three. Verse 14, someone read just verse 14. Hallelujah. I read in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. But without your content, should I do nothing, but your benefits should, should not be as it were of necessity, necessity by willing Amen. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Can we have somebody read in uh, King James? Maybe New King James or King James? Amen. I want to bring that to order. I read in Jesus' name. He said, But without that mind, would I do nothing? That thy benefit should not be a situation of necessity, but willingly. Amen. Amen. Now listen to 
Nuclear gen. That's a word I want us to hear here. Nuclear gen. He said, but without the concept, without the concept, I wanted to do nothing. That your good deed might not be by compulsion, as it were, but voluntary, without your concept. So number three stage is choice. Choice. Next, Paul communicates the decision in front of Philemon. The same way, you must lay out the choice in front of both parties as you understand it. Maintain their dignity, if possible. Take steps to sustain friendship. Take steps to sustain friendship. Let me say something here. You know, as children of God, there's something most of us are missing. We really get it wrong. When we want to speak, we want to act. Sometimes we don't consider the, the damage our actions or our statements is likely going to cause to the body. It is after the damage is done, we come to say, I'm sorry. We mustn't keep saying sorry. If we allow the Holy Spirit to guide and to lead us, we, he instructs us what to speak, how to speak, how to act, and how to react. So you can see that this lawyer will have brought serious misunderstanding between Paul and Philemon. But look at the diligent steps that Paul was taking. Paul brought this issue before him. He said, look, though I have the liberty to withhold this young man, or to order him to go back to you. For he said, but without your consent, Paul said, I need your consent. I needed you to be involved. I needed you to partner. We need to partner. Let's come into compromise. Why was Paul mindful of this? Paul was protecting their relationship. Paul was making sure he sustained the friendship, brethren, let me show that whatever thing we want to do, let's place our, our relationship, our friendship, our intimacy, let's place it before us to direct us on our actions and our and whatever utterances we make. So choice. For made Philemon to make a choice, for giving opportunity to make a choice. When you are exercising your authority, do you also allow um, those you are supporting, those you are leading, those you are discipling, give them opportunity to make a choice. If they make the wrong choice, then you can, you can come down to instruct them and say, look, this choice, for some so, so, so reason, I don't think it's the best choice you know, in this matter. That's where we come as leaders. Now, imagine what happened in... Um, Genesis chapter 13. I think we need to learn something from there. Please just flip to Genesis. My mind just draws to something that we may need to look at now. Genesis chapter 13. Genesis chapter 13. From verse 8. If you don't mind, someone read for from verse 8. Verse 8 to so now, eight and nine, please refer us. And Abraham said unto Lord, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my husband and thy husband, thy husband. For we be brethren. Mm. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right, or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Yeah. It, this was crossed my mind. I think this is a very, very um, relative example to what we're discussing, what the way for after. Now, let me ask, what would you have expected Abraham to do um, in this matter we just read? 
praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Naturally, uh, being the uncle of Lot, um, he would have, he would have um, selected the most uh, greener pasture. More so, for what we, if for what we, for what the scripture earlier said, when God asked him to flee from his father's land, the Bible said he took Lot along. Probably was the one that even trained Lot from his youthful age. But when it comes to separation, he said, let there be no problem. Just let us separate. You take this, take whatever you want. Praise the Lord. So Abraham supposed Hallelujah. in the leadership, supposed to be, I senior you, I, I'm, I'm older than you, I'm this and that. But he gave Lot the opportunity to choose. To choose. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. He gave Lord opportunity to choose. Do you know that even God gives us opportunity to choose? Joshua said, choose this day, this day whom you serve. But I know what is there. That's what he said. Choose this day, this day whom you serve. Now, something very key that made um, Abraham to take the step, there was something he said, there was something Abraham spotted um, that maybe he said, let there be no conflict. Can you remember the next thing he said? There was something that was protected. He said, we are brethren. He said, we are brethren. So we're saying here we must do everything possible to sustain our relationship, our friendship. We are brethren. So when we have issues or we have matters, brethren, the first thing is that we must assume a broken stage, a broken position. Abraham was a broken man. Abraham must have sat down, looked before he came to law. Abraham must have looked left and right and said, this place is good for me. He said, but if I choose this place, and I ask Lord, you go by here, this man, young man will be happy. And he said, look, let there be no conflict. Please choose. Look to the left. And if you go to the left, I move to the right. Go to the right, I move to the left. So Paul says to Philemon, without your consent, I won't do anything. Let it be voluntary. And I think the Lord is bringing on. This is a sign of humility. A sign of brokenness, a sign of love. We must be passionate in pursuing the love of Christ so that the brotherhood will be strong and fair. Praise the Lord. Number four. Number four, verse 15 to 20. Let's read again 15 to 20. Someone please refer up. Fifteen yes. to twenty. What's I read in Jesus' name. Philemon of uh, fifteen to twenty. It says, "For perhaps he therefore departed for a season, that thou shouldest receive him forever, not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, especially to me. But how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord? If thou count me therefore a partner." Receive him as myself. If he had wronged thee or hurt thee out, put that on my account. I, Paul, have written it with my own hand. I will repay it. I be it. I do not say to thee, add thou always unto me, even thy own self beside. Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, my God. It's Time. I don't like living out of this, but once you're ready, you can see Christ Jesus, you can see the love of God, you can see the brotherhood, you can see how careful and how diligent Paul was approach, approaching the issues to ensure there was no conflict between him and Philemon on account of honestness. So, what is the fourth stage here? The challenge stage. Challenge. Paul then challenged Philemon 
to do what was right. Can you see? To do what was right, you must commit yourself to the steps you will take. Then extend a clear challenge to them and await their response. Settle the issue. If possible, let our good boundaries and parameters to keep the relationship healthy. Don't let any means accumulate. What that means. So let's go back to that passage and see where Paul presented the challenge. Now look at what he says in verse from verse 16. Okay, 15 to 16 of the verse, he said, or perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose, that you might receive it forever. That's a challenge. He threw that challenge to you. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and the law. So Paul comes here to say to Philemon, this woman left you as a slave, but it's not returning back and presenting a man who is more than a slave. He is now a brother. Not just a brother, a beloved brother. Can you see that? That's a challenge. He has provoked the mind of Philemon and Philemon must have at that moment and say, wow, does it mean Philemon um, on this much is no longer what I used to do? Paul put his put him on the edge. And I think it's a very wonderful challenge to us. So when we're living in tough times, we must compliment, must compromise, there must be a place of choice, then a place of challenge. Then lastly, there's 21 and 22. 21 and 22. Twenty one, twenty two, and we read in Jesus' name. He said, "Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou will also do more than I say. But will that prepare me also a lodging? For I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you." Amen. Thank you. Amen. So the last stage is confidence. Confidence stage. Finally, Paul closed by expressing confidence that Philemon would take the higher road. My girl. Paul expected, he expressed his confidence that Philemon, having complimented him, having compromised, having presented the issue before him to choose, having challenged him, he expressed confidence. And by expressing sincere confidence in them as a person, let them know you trust them to do what's right and nothing will prevent you from loving them. Remember, it is more important to win a soul than to win an argument. Lovely. It's lovely. Sometimes you like to win arguments. We argue and argue and argue on points. And while the argument lasts, someone is losing confidence in his or her faith in the Lord. So Paul says to him, having confidence in your obedience, can you see that? So it's like a lawyer will say, I put it to you. So Paul invariably presented to him an option to take. In the midst of all this argument, I thought that you're going to take the right decision. You're going to make the right decision. You're going to take the highway. So I, I think, think when, we, when we allow these principles to work in our lives, we're going to be better leaders. Honestly, we're going to be better leaders. It will not be a crime that you're leading even the people of diverse background, perception, and views, 
there are minimal countries that can be entertained in a body that appreciates these five stages of leadership. And I think it will really help us. Praise the Lord. Now, before we leave these five points, let me give opportunity for any question or anybody who wants to explain, you know, um, if you have had an experience, you know, in any of these, uh, personally, I want to just share with them maybe for a few minutes or uh, three, four minutes before we run out of it, before we run away from it. Question or an expression? Um, so I have a question. Or a challenge. Yes, please. I have a challenge. Mm. My question is, what if you're put in a position where you you kind of compromise because you you feel yourself aged, uh, regardless of um, how old you are, or you take the position of sanctification and just keep tolerating, and then you are in a situation where somebody kind of take an advantage over your tolerance. My concern yeah. is, what, what do you what do you do in such circumstances where people or whosoever who's supposed to have known now in a in a congregation in in a group takes advantage over others because you know everybody wants to play the role of an angel and just try to and uh, accept uh, okay, being, uh, by uh, on the tolerate yeah uh, allowing tolerance. What will you do in such situation? Okay, thank you. Now, you see, we just read from my, um, Genesis chapter 12 about Abraham. Now, when Abraham conducted himself in such a manner, I believe that people around here would have said, What kind of behavior is that? Why should you? Are you not his uncle? Why must you bring yourself so low? But these are natural reactions that will come from people. But today, you and I, we have seen it as a strength and a path of God. Is that true? Let me come and share. Now, I, I remember mentioning to us here one of the times we started about my personal experience in ministry when I had some issues with my leadership and I was in a, a, a conspiracy by just a few persons. And when I saw how it was affecting, the country was going to destroy the ministry. So I decided to take that step of compromise. Now, when I called, I broke out on a Sunday service, the Lord told me, he stood to conquer. And that was very, very astounding to me, stood to conquer. And it was difficult. They offended me. It was in a place of politics. And I came on a Sunday, and I brought all the the government council one part, the board of trustees, and the congregation were just smoking and looking. So now I turned to each of them and I said, in any of offended you, please, I'm sorry for me. And I did all of that. Now, while that was going on, one of the sisters who was also one of the leaders knew that she had, she had very good understanding. She, she passed on that sister who lost her last year, December. The woman with the spirit of God. She screamed and said, No, don't do that. Don't do that. She said, Don't do that. But I knew what I was doing, what a lot of places I had to do. And I was not concerned what other people say and what they do. So I went out and I did all of I apologized to all of them. Do you know that at the end of the service, I received phone calls. Some of the young men say, Daddy, you have left a big shoe for us. Very big one and all of us. What you have done today, we've never seen it. And it was a compromise. Ordinary people would just take advantage. But do you know that by the grace of God, they began to respect me more. What they saw in me, they began to see the spirit of humility in me. What was meant to belittle me. Because, so I think that is when you set out to do what you know that will make the Lord happy, that will build the house, 
don't consider what people are going to do as a result of your action, how they're going to undermine you because they lack understanding. Those who have understanding, they will acknowledge that you have strength. That compromise is actually a strength in you. I think that's a little light that I'm throwing. Thank you, sir. Um, I, I don't just want to uh, pretend. Let me just make it a little bit direct, sir. It, it, this, it, I'm, I'm, um, I would like clarity on the issue of um, on, um, leader on leaders. So I don't know how, that, let me put it in a so, For instance, you, you have a, an army of leaders and they're supposed to know better. But then uh, you have one or two or one person or two who intentionally or consistently will always kind of straight, um, go uh, 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 press the wrong button. And when he acts that way or she okay. acts that way, and you're put in a position of doing something because necessity, you know, there, there is expectation from such, um, uh, that, um, um, such people or group because they're listed, they're supposed to be leaders. Necessity is laid upon them. There's an expectation. And such mannerism or characters are not welcome. So wouldn't others, how, as a leader, you, you're going to be looked up as gullible because others are waiting for you to act on, on that. And you're not doing it. And then what is good for the goose is good for the ganda becomes the scenario of others thinking, you as a leader, you've done you've done nothing when he or she is done it. Why must you do something if I do it? Then you're put in a very difficult situation as a leader because you don't know how to harness it because you're trying to make peace reign and this person will continue to press that button. Think, you know, and at a point, people are beginning to lose patience and thinking, if nothing could be done towards this fellow, then why must I consistently be under the control of the Holy Spirit when this one should be? So what will a leader, uh, what will you act, what would that leader do in such a situation? Because he or she is being looked at gullible by others because no present day. They, okay. Uh, okay. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now you have said leader of leaders. Now look at these two instances, Abraham and, um, and Lot. God called Abraham. Abraham have had an intimate relationship with God. Lord was just following, was just following. So Abraham treated him as someone who just made him not understand. Um, Paul and, and Philemon. Philemon was also like a disciple. But when you come to the rank of leader, now you remember what happened between Paul and, uh, and Peter? When Paul came and saw Peter, you know, um, eating with the Jews, and so many, so many remote, yeah, remember what happened? Paul rebuked him to say. He said, I rebuked him to say. When you, because Peter would have known the right thing to do. He became a hypocrite. When, when it comes to the level you are saying now, this is a point, you don't compromise matter. You must use the, the slate hammer first before you not come to, if there is any compromise. You must use the slave hammer, you must come hard because the person ought to know better. And when you have rebuked and corrected that individual, if that person has the spirit of God, will not take offense, will not take offense and say, there is a conspiracy or whatever. So uh, this is a very sharp departure from the context we are looking at. When, when we have grown to the point of chewing the bone, we must know that when we, when we press the wrong button, we are going to be rebuked, and that will make up a very careful and sensitive the kind of button we press, so that it doesn't attract, um, it doesn't attract an open rebuke or, or even a closed door rebuke. Praise the Lord. No compromise on that. Thank you, sir. God oh, bless you. Yes, someone else, sir. Yes, sir. Um, I don't know. I want to contribute um, to this. Um, um, uh, Pastor, Mrs. God bless you, sir. Pastor, God bless you. Um, I want to say um, two things. Number one, um, 
pastors, leaders, they are also human. And, um, you know, at times, they tend to neglect some things. They, they might see some people, like in the, when you see a brother that is so committed and so zealous, ah, this brother is fire for fire. Sometimes the, the my men of God may not even want to check the spirit in which that brother is operating with. Now, back to the question. If there is an issue where leaders are supposed to attend to and they are not attending to, like I said, they are human, they need prayers. Then number two, is a sign of the end time, you know. Um, you see, like I, like somebody was was watching the program and told me, "Our brother, so so man of God, need our prayers. We should pray for this man of God. We should pray. He's okay. The wife is okay, but the church is sinking. So, what am I trying to say in a nutshell? Men of God, sometimes they don't even want to check, want to say some truth, not because they don't know what to say." But because their mind might not be there, so they need prayers. They correct our prayers. And in some situation, we need the Spirit of God to actually deal with the situation through prayers. God bless you. Thank you, brother. Okay, thank you so much. So, let's... Um, is there any other contribution, any other question, uh, moderator? So we can just look at a few other things here. I want to look at biblical confrontation. Biblical confrontation. So this is a, a possibility that we're not going to look at um, very briefly um, what you are raising now. Biblical confrontation. When someone under your care has clearly done wrong, the Bible calls us to confront them on issues regarding sin, failure to keep a public commitment, the destructive attitude, harmful conversation, etc. If you waver on whether the Bible addresses this subject, let's look at the following passages and see what the Bible says. So what we're saying here is that there is a biblical confrontation Besides what we have just read about Paul and Philemon. Second Corinthians chapter 10, 4 and 5. Second Corinthians chapter 10, 4 and 5. So let's read these Bible passages and we can see what the Bible enjoins us to do. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5. Yes, I'm this. Read in Jesus' name. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the disobedience of Christ. Amen. Amen. So what are we learning here? Our weapons are designed to challenge people's thinking. You know that for whatever thing that happens, there's a spirit behind it. Either the spirit of God or the spirit of this world, set up. So the weapons, the word of God, the spirit of Christ in love has made us um, a weapon to challenge people's thinking. When people are behaving wrongly, when people are speaking perversely, when people are putting on some kind of attitude, then we are meant to rebuke them and also to challenge them so that they can think straight and act correctly. Number two, first Thessalonians chapter four, verse 14, five fourteen, rather. First Thessalonians chapter five, verse 14. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14. First Thessalonians 5, 14, I read. Now we exhort you, brethren, 
warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. Thank you. So we are reminded, we are to remind, we are to warn, we are to admonish the faith hearted. So that's our responsibility, part of our responsibility. We are to remind people, we are to warn people, we are to admonish those who are faith hearted. And all of this by the word of God. And that's why we must be sound with the scripture. So we don't remind people outside the word of God. You don't want people outside the word of God. You don't have money outside the word of God. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 2 to 4. Second Timothy chapter 4, 2 to 4. Second Timothy 4. Two to four. Four, four. I read. And they shall turn no, away. From verse two to four. Okay, two. No, from verse two, please. From verse two. Yeah. Second Timothy four, sir. I read from verse two. Yeah, four, verse two to four. Okay. okay. Preach the word. Be instant in season. Out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. 4. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. Amen. Thank you. Amen. So here we are, we must preach, we must reprove, we must rebuke and exalt with patience. This is the biblical standard. And of course, uh, Paul writes to Timothy here, in this last days, like my brother said earlier, the spirit of the last days is seriously at work. A lot of people are under satanic influence. People think irrational. People act so demonic and sometimes they can't cope, even inside, inside the church. So we must ensure that we preach the sound of truth. We must reprove. We must continue to rebuke. And of course, Continue to insult people. And the Bible says, with patience. Why? People take time to learn. People have um, different capacity of growth. So, as a leader, don't give up on anyone. Continue to preach. Continue to reprove. Continue to rebuke. Continue to insult. And be patient with them. In love, of course, in love that where we rebuke and reprove is in love. So that the essence of it is not lost. Galatians, Colossians chapter 1, verse 28. Colossians 1, 28. Colossians 1, 28. Colossians 1, 28, I read, sir. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Hmm. Hallelujah. So here we must admonish one by reminding people and portraits us here. Because as leaders, whether you're the leader of the people, 
the leader of leaders, the responsibility, the onus lies on you. So preserve the people of Christ. And this is a very big challenge to us. So when they're going to ask, for how long are we going to wait? You are rebuking, you are preaching yet. When you talk today, tomorrow, someone else is going to be presented perfect in Christ Jesus. Brethren, this is a challenge. But the question is, have we presented ourselves unto the Lord? You know, those who tell you that nobody can be perfect. Here is the word of God. Here is the standard of God. Every man, we don't need to be perfect when we get there. He said, be perfect here before I come. So perfection, where is it today? Who is serving to us? For years, he said, be man of us. Titus 1 to 10. Titus 1 to 10. I just wanted to say someone read for us. Just now. Titus 113. This witness is true. We are for we have rebuked them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Amen. Hmm. Amen. Now let me take it up from the said, For there are many insubordinates, both idle talkers and deceivers. Especially those of the circumcision, whose mouth must be stopped, who subvert whole household, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of this honest gift. One of them, a prophet of their own, said, Christians are always like evil beasts, lazy, blue tongues. So, this is the background of all this. That's the thing. On account of these issues highlighted like here, Paul says, he said, the testimony, the things that we have heard, they are true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound and fair. So, can you see the rest of the top time? Now, if you are living in an environment where this kind of thing, somebody mentioned, where people talk idly, People are deceivers and all manner of, you know, worldly characteristics. And you're living such a brother. That's a really tough one. That's a tough time and tough work. So we are instructed to prove that others may be sound in faith. That's our responsibility. You see, because there is other thing, you see, it will be done sharply. There are some things that don't need management. You rebuke right that moment. I don't know if uh, let me share this. Be some air on itself. Uh, I, I need to say this so that as many people are going to listen to this, they will be warm. Last month, somebody sent me a post on WhatsApp. I didn't want to send it to search on a platform because. I just wonder how many people are going to bear the, the you know, the abomination, so the abominable message of presented. That this of the Lord brother who have really worked so hard, you know, in the body of Christ globally in Ukraine, it's not a bit of I've heard about it, the testimony of this man over and over. The single largest church in Ukraine, and um, he's one pastor. But here was a post he put together with his family, his wife and his children. Well, what was the message? They said that people um, have thought that if you're a believer, born again, sanctified in the Holy Spirit, washed with the blood, and you commit sin, and that sin, you are unable to confess it. And suddenly you die, maybe by accident. They say you go to hell. 
He said it is false. The best thing we go to heaven. Because already was sanctified. That sin he committed before he died will not take him to hell. He went for that sin for himself. If somebody commits fornication, and he goes for committing fornication by error or by whatever, and he's a born again sanctified, was in the blood, and he just fell into the sin of fornication. And now he just died. And then he didn't have time to confess that sin. He said he would make her. That is an error, heresy. And this kind of place, you need to be reduced sharply. Because the world will be fled. Look at the position this man will appear. And it's coming with this kind of heresy. You are not encouraging people to live in, in immorality. To take sin for granted. Praise the Lord. So these are the kind of people is asking that we must reduce that everything sharply. You don't need to excuse the person behind. This is should be reduced. And reduced sharply. Why? Because others need to be sound. If you don't do this, they're going to make gullible walls, you know, within the midst, within the congregation. To fall away. We are the last days. There are things we must not tolerate. There are errors we must not tolerate. There are some kind of things about the nation that is going to, you know, wreck um, an organization and ministry. Wreck it. We must not tolerate. We must reduce it. And we must all be ready to, to be rebuked, to receive correction. We don't take offense because it is only in this that we grow. And also to receive the virtue to grow others. Leaders are made to chew the food, not flesh. Praise the Lord. Remember, the goal is to see them transformed by the power of God. The objective is not condemnation, but restoration. People must know we love them, but we love truth more than anything. in the world. An examining life is not an unexamined life is not worth living. Any man who does not examine him or herself is not worth living. We love the people but we must love the truth over and above everyone. And the life and the life. No one comes to the father and say And this note I want us to, to pray. I want us to pray. I want us to ask for the Lord. We really have for the things we have talked about this evening. By the Holy Spirit, we just say that an unexamined life is not what living. Because to examine yourself whether you are still in the faith. You might be in the faith, but you are not correct in the faith. I would pray and ask the Lord. Father, I have you once again, be in your such light on me. You are microscopic light, let's be big of me. That I might see everything else. Every aspect of my life. But I don't see in my life that are capable of ruining the life, the faith of others. Oh Lord, they are working my life. Can we pray? In the name of Jesus, Father Lord, we pray, O Lord, this hour, that you, Lord, from God, Lord, take hold of our lives in the name of Jesus, in my life, O God, my Father, that we win, me, Lord, take it away in the name of Jesus. The Lord lead me low in the name of Jesus Christ. So in the name of Jesus Christ, O Lord, King of Glory. Father, Lord, King of Glory, may you rebuke us, correct us anyway, O Lord, King of Glory, that we need to be corrected in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, divine be our guide, lead us in the right path in the name of Jesus. All that steps are right. O Lord, King of Glory, that we are right to bring glory and praise to your name in the name of Jesus. Help us to do the right thing, to take the right step. Father, give me the grace, O Lord, Father, to speak right. Now. Lord, let my mouth be used for your glory. Let my tongue be used for your praise in the name of Jesus. Let the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart be acceptable unto you in the name of Jesus. Father, Lord, my God, says you, Lord, you, Lord, Lord, my Father, everything that is not of you in my life in the name of Jesus. Father, Lord, my God, you are the potter and the clay. Father, mold me and shape me in the name of you after your will in the name of Jesus. Father, Lord, anyway, I am found wanting, oh God, I pray for your 
We are so Lord in the name of Jesus. We want to be your Lord and to walk unto perfection for you. In the name of Jesus. Jesus. Finally, finally, can we ask the Lord to, to plant another you know, spirit of humility? The spirit of humility, so we will be able to accept corrections and all the humility to accept correction and the humility, the kind of humility we that Abraham exemplified that he could tell his nephew, Lord, choose whatever you choose. That was, and we see it in Paul that this humility to compromise, fully compromise, and the humility to accept rebuke and correction. And we add that the Lord will plant this. Mighty name Father, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord, that they plant in me, Lord, a spirit of humility. Let me to be meek and humble. Give me a meek spirit, a quiet spirit in the name of Jesus. Father, Lord, give me your spirit of meekness in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, give me the grace, Lord, Lord, King of God, in the name of Jesus. Father, to be able to handle conflict like the Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, help me to always pursue after peace. Lord, God, we never fall from faith in the name of Jesus. Father, give me your Lord, my Father, keep so not to be humble, the grace to be broken, the grace to accept correction and rebuild, the grace to do the right thing in the name of Jesus, Father Lord, I yield myself. I yield my tongue to you, Lord, Father Lord, that I need you to set me. Father, set a watch over my mouth, set a watch over my tongue in the name of Jesus. Please, Father, I'm going to show you the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Lord, we thank you today. We know, Lord, that you have taught us. And we pray, Lord, as the rapture draws closer, as the world, the event around the world, uh, signal the coming of the Lord. Lord, I pray that you will help everyone, of course, as we learn that Lord we will not become vessels that be uh, discarded on the last day. Holy Spirit, help us to be broken. The Lord, that in virtues of love from Paul today, and dealing with Philemon on the next month's case, and that of the Abraham with love. Lord, I pray that you will uh, cause us to invite these virtues so our life will become a light in this world. That word. We thank you today. Take all the praise and love. In Jesus Christ, name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Bless the name of the Lord. This hour, let's open our mouth. Let's begin to pray for the man of God that the Lord abused. For virtue has gone out of him. Let's pray for the feeling and grace of God upon his life in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's pray for him. Father, Lord, I God, we thank you for your servant that you have used this hour. Father, to be a blessing to us, we pray in the name of Jesus. Even as virtue has gone out of him, Father, feel him, oh God. Give him that grace, Father, Lord. I pray that these words will not stand against him in the day of judgment. Father, I help us that this word will not stand against us on the last day in the name of Jesus. Father, Lord, my God, I pray for your servant that you, Lord, will have your way in his life, oh Lord, in the name of Jesus and uphold him, O oh Lord, by your power and give him the grace to stand. Give him the grace to stand. Give him the grace to stand in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. I'll call up Pastor Teresa to you. Uh, Pastor Felix is there, sir. Please, can you round up for us with prayer? Praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much because of this wonderful evening. We thank you for the, the word of life you've spoken to us. Father, we ask and pray that the grace and the power to live by your word, to be the door of the word, not just the hearer of the word. Father, we ask you that you give us such a wonderful grace in Jesus' name. Righteous Father, we commit our beloved pastor that you have used to, to feed us with the word of life tonight. I ask and pray that, oh God, that you replenish your anointing, that, Lord, the oil of your anointing will never run dry in his life. I pray for him. I pray for his family. I pray for his ministry, that forward ever, backward ever, in the mighty name of Jesus. And, Father, we pray for ourselves as the people that you have spoken to tonight, that, Lord Jesus, 
We don't want to leave any stone unturned. We want to go from high to from one level to another level. We want to go to the higher ground. Father, we ask and pray that you help us, O oh God. We know that it's not an easy road. It's not an easy race. But we depend on your ability. We depend on your grace. We depend on your help, Lord. Father, please renew us day by day. Help us, O oh God, to live for you on a daily basis, to live a holy life, righteous, perfect, and pure life. That everything in us that does not glorify your name, Lord, root them out by the blood of Jesus. Father, we thank you, blessed Savior. We pray for all our brethren that couldn't attend the meeting. We ask you that as they watch the, or listen to this telecast on their own, Father, speak to them, bless them as you have blessed us tonight. Thank you, blessed Jesus. We give all the glory, honor, and majesty back to your holy name. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, sir. Hallelujah. Of course, Sister Jovita, please, what can you give us the announcement? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Announcements remain the same. By His grace, we are beginning um, our day with the word 4 a.m. London time. And our children program still remain Mondays till Thursday. So tomorrow being Thursday, our children are going to have their program 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. London time for the godly children in Christ and the godly teenage in Christ, 8 p.m. London time. Again, we have decentralized. It doesn't mean that we are separated. It means we are, we are, we are gathering in our different groups. That's how we used to be, to sharpen one another. The word of God said, iron sharpens iron. In order for us to, to grow more and still come back together as we are doing now. That's, that's taking place only in 12 p.m. afternoon prayer. Other prayer remains the same. We, still to, we are still together. Praise the Lord. So we are still together, my brethren. Hallelujah. Amen. Our program, our Bible study, tomorrow we are still coming back with our beloved pastor, C.Y. for the word. Amen. And our deliverance program, Friday, 7 p.m. Our deliverance prayer. Come and be blessed. And your life will never remain the same in Jesus' name. Amen. Remember our forthcoming annual conference in Austria. Austria 2018 by the grace of God. Even if you're online, sacrifice. Come and be life. And you'll be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen. We are still having our own program, our sub-conference in London, UK, by the end of next month, March, by the grace of God. As we do it, as we tarry in the presence of God, we will never lose that reward in Jesus' name. God bless you all, brethren, in Jesus' name. Amen. Over to you, my beloved sister. Amen. God bless you, ma. Please, can we share the grace together in fellowship? Amen. May the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with us now and forevermore. Amen. Surely God's goodness and his mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. And we and our entire soul shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Please let's take a few seconds.